This week, we welcome Antonio Sanchez, Principal Evangelist from Fortra, to discuss the cybersecurity workforce gap and insights from this year's RSA conference. In the enterprise security news, a slow week for funding, but as always, a busy week for AI news. Databricks acquires Okira. CrowdStrike, Fortinet, and other cybersecurity shares rise. Merck might finally get the $1.4 billion payout for not Petya. Ex-Uber CISO Joe Sullivan won't go to jail. Google rolls out passkey support. Do, par do bartenders make good pen testers? Maybe. We'll talk about that one a little more. ICS using sten stenography to hide data. DEF CON will unleash hackers on large language models and security's eternal prioritization problem. In our final segment, we air three pre-recorded interviews from Zscaler, Island, and Sumo Logic at RSA Conference 2023. All that and more on this episode of Enterprise Security Weekly. This is a Security Weekly production for security professionals by security professionals. Please visit securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe to subscribe to all the shows on our network. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where we talk security vendors and aren't afraid to name names. It's Enterprise Security Weekly. When organizations face poor web performance, challenges building modern applications at scale, or need to reduce operational and development costs, they turn to Fastly. Fastly's distributed edge network means your business can unleash its growth potential without worrying about scaling your infrastructure, whether for growth of users, transaction volume, or geographic expansion. Get the speed, security, and edge cloud innovation you need to deliver profitable and engaging experiences. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash Fastly for more information or to speak to an expert. Welcome to Enterprise Security Weekly and happy National Eat What You Want Day. Okay, I'm going to eat what I want today. This is episode number 317, recorded May 11th, 2023. I'm your host, Matt Alderman, sitting in for Adrian, who is busy getting set up for B-Sides Knoxville. Joining me today as my co-host, first, Miss Katie Teitler. Welcome, Katie. Hello, good to see you, sir. Good to see you. I, I haven't seen you in a while. I miss you. Um, it's always so fun to talk to you. Yeah, I missed RSA this year, but that's okay. There's lots of, lots of other opportunities. Yes, absolutely. This podcast, for one. Right, also exactly. Joining, that's why we're here. Right. Also joining who I missed this week on my show, Mr. Tyler Robinson. Welcome, Tyler. Hey, Matt. I don't know about, I don't like this, like, I'm missing a week here and there. It's like the only time I get to see you. So it was uh, definitely missing you as well. Thank you. You bring great insights to the conversation. I miss it. Join us at an upcoming official cybersecurity summit in a city near you. This series of one day invitation only executive level conferences are designed to educate senior cyber professionals on the latest threat landscape. We are pleased to offer our listeners $100 off admission when you use the code SECWEEK23 to register. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash cybersecurity summit to learn more and register today. This segment is sponsored by Fortra. To learn more, please visit securityweekly.com forward slash Fortra. Antonio Sanchez serves as principal evangelist at cybersecurity and services provider Fortra. He has over 20 years in the IT industry focusing on cybersecurity information management, and disaster recovery solutions to help organizations of all sizes manage threats and improve their security posture. Antonio is a CISSP and has held various leadership roles at Semantic, Forcepoint, and Dell. Antonio, welcome to Enterprise Security Weekly. Hi, thanks for having me here today, and thanks for letting me know that it's a national eat what you want day. Now I just got to figure out exactly what I want to eat today. Yes. Yeah, Adrian always pulls in these national whatever days it is on his podcast. And the last time it was like National Beer Day or something like that, which was way more exciting for me than eat whatever you want, because I kind of do that anyways. <laughs> What's the only reason I work out is just so I can eat what I want. So right. now I can do that today and not feel guilty about it. Exactly right. So Antonio, you wanted we wanted to start first a little bit on the workforce side, and it's interesting. We actually did a, a 
We have this segment on Business Security Weekly we call Say Easy, Do Hard. It's, it's named after uh, my co-host. He, he kind of coined this phrase. It's, it's easy to say. It's much harder to do. So once a quarter, we do a Say Easy, Do Hard segment where we try to really break in and, and try to solve some of the really hard problems that are hard to solve. And the last one we did was on closing the skills gap. And the question that, that we wanted to answer first was, is, is it a shortage of talent or is it a skills gap? Because there's, it, it's kind of interesting. Like, do we not have enough people or do we, those people just not have the right skills to help us fill that gap? It's a great question, and I've I've talked to different folks and have gotten different answers. But one of the answers that I keep hearing over and over is there's concern that while there may be some skills, there aren't the enough type of skills or able to demonstrate the type of skills that they want. Because in many cases, organizations, while they know there's a skill gap and they know there's people that want to learn, do they really want to take the time to teach them while they're safeguarding their organization? Um, somebody has to do it. Somebody needs to do it in order for them to, to, to show value to them as the organization. But somebody's also got to take the chance to be able to show them to do just those things. I mean, some of them can get it through education. Some organizations have great programs to be able to start them off at a beginner into a junior level into a senior level and with that there's always a concern are we going to take this time to bring these people up to speed and get them to where we want them only to lose them to a competitor after we've invested so much into them there's programs in different parts of the world where they're actually fast tracking professionals into that because the need is so great that they'd rather take them even though they're junior level to be able to put them in those roles and whatever they can contribute is still better than what they had before but in other places it's kind of the the, the mindset of we don't necessarily want to take the time to get you there to then lose you so it's it's organizations have to decide what works for them so yeah it's it, it's it's kind of classic chicken the egg conversation you know i need a job so I can have experience, but I need experience to have a job. So it's kind of some of the same things that we're, that we're seeing. Although I did see some interesting things, um, not just at our RSA, but also some, some previous uh, 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 cons that I've been to where there's some organizations that are doing simulations as a service where they'll test your expertise and they'll up-level your, your skill set so that way you have some experience that you can at least demonstrate without actually being in the role. So I thought that was an uh, interesting use case or interesting use of getting the people to up-level their skill sets so that they can position themselves for those particular opportunities. Do you think that's a, a better solution to the, the kind of traditional certificate route where we're kind of iterating on the, the cert path and getting to a place where we have uh, demonstrable skills that can be verified and answered? Sorry, you came in and out, but I think what I heard you say is get demonstra demonstrable information. Well, yeah, just like you want to have some sort of artifact to be able to demonstrate your, you know, credentials of whatever it is that you do, the same level of having that level of artifact, artifact to be able to demonstrate, I've done this type of training in a controlled environment. Here's where I did well. Here's where there were some opportunities for improvement. Here's what I did about them and then re-demonstrating again. I mean, it's what a lot of organizations do as it relates to their security posture. This is where we are now. This is our point in time snapshot a month ago, three months ago. This is where we are today. This is how we show improvement. Same thing for the for the personal skills gap. So th there's there's organizations that are coming out and that's kind of what they're doing is put them in a safe environment sort of like a simulated rapid fire, see how they react, work with them to improve that, and then show them something that they can demonstrate to that potential employer. Like, this is what I've done, and I took this initiative to go do that, and I'm ready to take on that responsibility uh, to protect this organization or help protect this organization. So that seems to me like a really good way to up level yourself or to build skills for incoming people. But I want to step back a little bit 
because it's the age old problem, as you mentioned, he, he, if you don't have skills, you can't get a job, but how do you get skills? If you can't get a job. Well, you just mentioned one thing, but that's at industry conferences. So they're not available to everybody and it's expensive to even get there and get the pass. What are companies doing? Because I know that obviously there are a lot of security seats that aren't filled and they're saying they don't want to take the time, as you said, to train people up, but then that leaves them without people. So it seems like a double-edged sword if you're making that decision. What do you see companies doing? Are they just leaving those positions open? Are they trying to move people through the organization who at least have some knowledge of it? What What's really happening in most organizations? Because if you just leave those position, positions open, is that really better than having somebody with a little bit of knowledge? Right. It's dependent on organization. I mean, it, it seems in some of the forums that I follow on, on various places seem to recognize that some organizations need to take the chance and give people opportunities to be able to come in as entry level, turn into junior, turn into senior. So there's some of that happening for others, uh, the organizations, or at least some of the things that, uh, again, I'm seeing on some of the other communities that I'm involved with, they're getting experience through whether it be internships or even going through managed service providers, managed security services providers, where typically they can come in and they will have a program to be able to teach them and have a curriculum to be able to up-level their skills. And then yet for other companies, it's like, you know what, um, let's figure out how we can do more with what we have, whether that is can we automate some of the things within our environment that would normally require a human? Are there repetitive things we can automate that used to require human intervention to be able to do that? But we've seen it enough times such that we can go ahead and automate those things and that'll help relieve the burden. Or other option would be, do we bring in a partner of some sort to help us alleviate some of that burden that we would normally have, some of that operational burden of managing the security tech stack or a certain part of our security tech stack, let them deal with it and get to, and and we give them the parameters of if condition equals x this is when we want you to engage with us directly versus this is how else we want to engage so th there's different options they still need the security outcomes they still need to have them for the ones that want the experience there are a few avenues but for the organizations that need to solve for it if the, if they can't figure they their their best bet is to either figure out how they can automate within their environment across their operations if not look to potentially bring in a partner to help them with that and relieve some of that burden for them. Yeah, that was actually so going to be my you. next question. So I'm glad that you hit on that. You know, in a lot of cases, companies are reluctant to automate. They're they're nervous about the outcomes, and then there are those people who think that they're going to be automated right out of a job. That's absolutely not true. I mean, at least not in the foreseeable future. You need these co-pilot type of situations in your organization. Um, but but are you seeing more people embrace automation because you know, I see it at my current company with what the product we offer and in talking to other companies, knowing people are just hesitant about automation, even though some of those low level tasks are really not necessary to be done by a human. Right. There, some of those low level tasks, I mean, it's low value to be doing those. So yeah. Uh, figuring out where to automate. And there's always that hesitancy because you hit it right on the head. What if I automate something and I have some unintended outcome where I get yelled at for stopping, you know, a revenue generating asset, for instance, or I revoke a credential to an executive, you know, that, that shouldn't have been revoked or something like that. Um, but in the last few years, I mean, we the the number I keep seeing thrown around, and you've probably seen this, ISC squared has, has quoted this a few times, the number tends to hover between two and a half to three million unfilled jobs. And it always hovers around that job. And organizations are realizing that that number is really not going to get much shorter or much smaller anytime soon. So they have to adopt autom automation to be able to help but going back to there, there, there's plenty of, of, of opportunities to be able to see enough of the same repetitive action happening over and over and over. And maybe it isn't a full automation. Well, they say, if you see this action, go ahead and take X action. But rather, if you see this action, give a recommendation immediately to whoever the security leader is 
given the opportunity, we see this action, we recommend you take this action or do nothing or reassign it for more thing for, for more evaluation. And then this way you have the human to be able to interact and make a judgment call based on the context of the information that's given to them and then go ahead and take that action. That's still better than manually doing anything because you've automated part of the process and allow a human to be able to interact in the middle to be able to make the human decision before taking on whatever that final action is. So that's that's a way for organizations to step into automation. And then when they see things that are happening enough times and the highly repetitive stuff and know that they're not have with high confidence that they're not going to, that the action, the automated action they take, where usually they would do, th there's a human checkpoint. It's like, we can go ahead and let that happen because we've seen that happen enough and we know there's not going to be an unintended consequence. So it, it's about the, the the willingness of the maturity of the organization to be able to embrace automation. And for the most part, the smaller the organization, it seems like the mid mid-sized customers, mid-sized enterprises are the ones that are jumping on board with that because they don't have as deep of the pockets as say some of the Fortune 500 companies that can offer you know, a, a healthy compensation package to somebody with with the skill set to maybe do some of those things. But even the bigger companies are doing the same thing because complexity of those environments, where can they automate? It's where SOAR became so popular the past few years, where SOAR was a category. And then all of a sudden you had SOAR vendors become embedded SOAR capabilities. We had a lot of other organizations that were that, that had embedded SOAR capabilities so they can embed some of these automations within their uh within their within their within their tech stack what what areas of automation are you seeing um being highly successful for some of these organizations right there's uh the difference between automation and artificial intelligence right i don't think artificial intelligence in and of itself so far has proven that it can handle everything so there's smart integrations of uh, the AI chatbots, all the the uh, mach machine learning of the world that we're trying to integrate into all of our tools, but then there's also the the automation piece, which is completely separate and or can be integrated and together. So, what parts are you seeing the companies are leveraging these things successfully, and what areas do you see that are a little immature still, and we still have uh, a substantial amount of testing and and vetting to do in order to get to a place where this is useful and uh, from a budget and time constraint standpoint, uh, viable for a business to actually leverage. So a few places that, that we've seen are things like log review. I mean, just about every single compliance mandate requires some sort of level log review. Well, you've got logs coming in from a number of different sources, from your tech stack to your cloud security providers to your specific security stack and being able to automate some of that to be able to eliminate that first line of noise, potentially even that second uh, level of noise. So that way you can get to higher fidelity information that is more manageable for a human to be able to look at. Other places we've seen have to do with, you know, I mean, if we think about EDR as a technology, EDR has some automation already built into it because if it finds something malicious, it'll isolate a host off of a network. Other things that that we've been seeing with some success include things like um, shunning an attacker, updating a policy to be able to block a certain IP, uh, being able to uh, um, um, disable credentials for any sort of um, event that looks that that has high confidence of being a compromised credential. So some some things like that. Uh, is is where we're seeing it but at the end of the day i mean there's there there's there's multiple mul there's multiple opportunities for for things to happen and in the world that we're kind of living in the more that can happen at machine speed the faster because we're not going to stop all the bad guys from getting in but the better we are at being able to help detect some of that and having some of these actions happen at machine speed and having a human interact in places where it makes sense before that action takes place is still better um then you know uh then before to limit the potential impact of whoever it is that that's gone through and there's other use cases provisioning systems i mean uh, there's 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 lots of places that is not necessarily always within the security part of the tech stack it could be in the in the operational part of the tech stack so like i mentioned go provisioning a new user there's a lot of automations with there and many times it's it's the the workflows that they have built in so some of the things that, that, that at least we've been seeing and talking with customers and, and partners as well.
Now, those are those are great examples. Honestly, those are the examples I was hoping you would kind of use uh, directly away from some of the security pieces. Uh, from the executive standpoint, take the the opposite approach to maybe you haven't been using as much automation in your environment or you've been hesitant to leverage some of the AI technologies, but you've got executives now uh, where we have this as a common common theme with inside of major main source news executives are, are talking amongst themselves and they're bringing um, ideas and wanting to understand how we're going to leverage automation in the environment in the enterprise how are we going to deploy and leverage uh, ai for our day-to-day -day use or they want to bring it into the environment what are some of the things that you guys are uh advising around that uh that conversation with the executives at the executive level for the enterprise Okay, I, I'm sorry, having a little bit of a hard time hearing you. I don't know if it's just me. It was a little muffled, but um, I think what I heard you say is what are the executives or how are executives looking at that? I'm just having a hard time of hearing. I'm not sure if it's I'm having no, yeah, audio difficulties. It, it may be it may be on our side, but yeah, the the executives. How are we bringing that conversation where the executives are asking, are we going to be delivering uh, AI or using AI? How we looking in the enterprise to begin implementing AI, uh, what are the, some of the conversations around that from the executive and enterprise side and things that uh, executives are starting to talk about and, and ask about? Oh, uh, the things we're hearing executives are asking about is, does this help close the gaps? Does this help close some of the headcount gaps that we have? Does this put us at risk for something? I mean, there's always something in the news nowadays. It seems like you can't go a day without seeing some AI technology that put somebody's information on compromise. A certain generative AI company was in the news this week, or it's like that last week, I think, for, for just that. But even at the executive level, I mean, at the end of the day, most executives that, that we've talked to are concerned typically with, does this help us either increase revenue? Does this help us increase market share? Does this help us reduce our costs? And if generally, if something fits within one of those three things, you kind of have their interest because at the end of the day, there's not a single executive that I'm aware of that whose goal is to be the most secure company in the world, the most secure organization in the world. They're concerned about how is security going to enable the organization? Is this a technology that's going to enable us to be able to close some of the, uh, whether it's the skills gaps or other types of headcount gaps that we have within the organization that are going to support the, the business uh, initiatives to be able to, to grow revenue you know, market share or um, revenue market share or, or, or reduce their, reduce their costs. So yeah, from that level, I mean, they, they don't get really as much into the tech unless they happen to see something in the news of something being, you know, done compromised or something like that. But at least that's, that's kind of the, 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 the type of conversation that we're hearing. Antonio, I want to, let's say that automation fixes a percent, let's say it's 20% of the skills mm -hmm. gap, right? Because I can optimize, maybe I don't need as many people. That still puts us at the two to two and a half million mark, right? So then the question becomes, what else do we need to be doing as an industry? Because there, look, I, I think the, the old scenario was people come out of the military, they go into financial services, they get trained up, then we hire them from the financial services companies and pull them out. That model's not going to survive. And if if I'm if I decide not to hire them and now I hire service companies, now I'm just putting the burden on the service companies to go train them up or hire these resources. So, what else do we need to be doing? Because I'm I, I think shifting shifting it around isn't going to solve the core problem. It's just going to put it on somebody else's plate. Yeah, you're absolutely right, and you're probably right. It probably does get us twenty percent there or whatever that percentage there. But really, as an industry, we have to get better. We have to make things easier. We have to make things easier for customers. We have to uh, make it easier for them to leverage the tools that are used to be able to 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 protect their environments. Uh, easier to to manage uh, just everything. So that burden really really at the end of the day falls on the the the, the, the you know people like us, vendors like us, and and making ma making it easier to consume and to use their products and services. Cause yeah, a portion of it will, you know, automation will handle some of that. If you, you know, outsource some of that to another provider, okay, you've got another portion, call it another 20%, 30%, you know, there's still that other percentage. Is it ever going to be a hundred? No, 
but it, it's probably why one things I one of the things I notice at at, uh, at RSA and a few other conferences is that it seems like more and more organizations are going with platforms and trying to. It, it's becoming a platform world where how can we simplify how organizations are going to get to the next level? Because we can't just transfer all of that burden on somebody else or expect somebody else to fix it. So we have to get, as a community, we have to get better. We have to place nice together. We have to work together. Because I was in one of the sessions and one of the one of the panel sessions and one of the speakers said, it's not us versus us versus them. It's us. We all have something that we need to, the, the, a, a part to play in that. But I think it starts with, you know, kind of getting out of this mindset of I'm going to get this next tool for this next specific type of attack for this specific vector, which is why there's, what is it, like 4,000 or 4,500 vendors, which is more than 2x of what it was just 10 years ago. We have to say, we've got to make it easier. We've got to integrate more capabilities. We've got to make it easier for people to use the products. We've got to be able to enable uh, the customers to be able to leverage as much of that as possible to be able to to again continue to close that gap because it doesn't seem like that gap is going to close anytime soon right and, and i think look the, the consolidation play is real i see it every single day mm -hmm. right can i take my existing portfolio consolidate it down to fewer vendors because one of the things that does is it just maybe you need fewer resources but you definitely kind of streamline the, the the learning curve around products, right? And so I see this every day. We're never going to get down to one platform or not even maybe five platforms. It was funny. I had, I had um, it was a guy from Salesforce, um, Renee will remember, but he said ZTN or uh, zero trust is not a skew. And, and he said, it's not even five SKUs, right? I can't buy five platforms to cover zero trust, right? Mm -hmm. It's a little more than that. So, I mean, what, what, where, where do we get as an industry? Where do we see the consolidation and kind of how does this play out? Does it come down to like 10 core vendors and that's it? We're done? I mean, that'll be great to see. Uh, a lot of the organizations we speak to, the larger companies, 50, 60, 70, even 100 vendors that they have in-house. And to your point, some of those have platforms and they have a lot of overlapping capability and technology. So the vendor consolidation, it, it's real. And is, is the number going to be 10? Is that the number that organizations are going to try to strive for? Maybe. If I'm a vendor, if I'm a company that has 100, uh, 100 vendors as part of my security stack, is my goal to get 10? Well, that's probably not realistic. Is my goal to get maybe 30? Possibly that might be more realistic. But part of that is just also understanding your environment, understanding uh, where how, how the data flows, understanding what you need to do to be able to protect that, and then being able to evaluate uh, what are the things that are going to allow me to be able to do that, but scale even beyond what my data protection team has to do, as well as my vulnerability management team is going to have to do, and maybe even some of my operations team can be able to, 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 to use as well, and scaling that down to something more, more manageable. Uh, but we hear we we've been hearing it a lot. It's like it'd be great if somebody can do the hard part of just stitching this stuff together. All these things that are out there, somebody go out there, stitch this stuff together, give it the same look, give it the same feel, make everything kind of behave the same as I needed to behave uh, to make it easier to 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 adopt. So you know, is the number ten? Maybe maybe that number is fifteen, but ten and fifteen are still better than seventy. Yeah. So you know. Time will tell. We'll wait and see. But 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 that's that's one of the things that we're we're focused on is to hopefully be one of those ten or one of those fifteen that provides something with a lot of capability. Yeah, you know, I'm, I did interview John Grinsarich when we were at RSA. He runs your strategy side. I asked you before whether mm -hmm. you reported to him or into into Mike Devine. But you know, th that's where I see some very interesting movement with what you guys have done. I don't think people realize all the companies you've acquired, but more importantly, not just the acquisition about how you've been stitching them all together to create a more cohesive platform, right? I mean, John was talking about this when, when I interviewed him at RSA a few weeks ago of how deliberate you've been about making the look, the feel, everything very consistent. And I think that goes a long way when you start thinking about consolidation and the impact on skills. If everything works and feels the same off of a common platform, 
the learning curves less and maybe the number of resources to manage it are less, which which would be a benefit in this particular environment. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And 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 that's that's exactly what we're what we're working towards because again, we recognize the skills gap. We recognize the short the, the shortages. We recognize that's not gonna that it's probably gonna be around for at least the next five years. Uh, we recognize the requirements as it relates to automation as well. Um, so we're trying to build some of that stuff uh, also. And we also recognize that this is a fast moving industry. The threat landscape moves faster than anything I've ever been a part of. There's always going to be a new attack, a new vector. So how can we best prepare to do that? And how do we we, we build a solution that's going to be able to adapt as we go? Because at the end of the day, I mean, isn't that what we all have to do? We have to adapt to the next thing and the next thing. And the thing that we hadn't even thought about yet, you know, I, you know, th there's always that that new thing, that new attack vector that hadn't been there before. It wasn't that long ago, you know, something like API security wasn't even a thing. What's right. an API? Who was working with APIs? And now there's organizations that that do that. So yeah, that's 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 the that's the idea. That's the strategy. That's the hope that we're able to get to by being able to. Um, help organizations to be able to make it easier to consume the products and hopefully build a solution that makes that learning curve a little lower and makes it less of a burden in the event that they do have turnover and they can bring somebody else in and kind of pick up right where the last person left off. So let's tie this into insights from RSA because at RSA, I go to two primary places on the show floor, right? I go to early stage expo, and I go to all the perimeters, right? Down the sides and the back. Like, I know all the guys in the middle. Like, I've been in the industry long enough. I know everybody in the middle. I want to see all the other ones. And here's my concern. We have a lot of me too's. Like, I went through early stage expo. There were four island competitors as in early stage expo, all trying to build a secure browser. Like, do we need five secure browser technologies? Like, are, can people survive in these kind of point solutions? And so it was interesting for me to walk through the floor to think about how many of these guys can actually survive as a standalone, knowing what we just talked about, consolidation, platform, in, highly integrated. Do the point solutions have much of a chance? And, and did you see the same thing or did I, I miss something? I, I so I typically I there's a few things I do aside from catching some sessions here and there that I always uh, learn something from. For me, I like learning kind of the legal side, so the law related kind of stuff uh, about security. But I I do the same thing. I walk the show floor. I'll do a loop around the entire floor. I'll see who's up at the front. I'll see who's in the back. Who's in the sides, and see some ahas. And some of the some of the vendors that I see in there, it, it does make me wonder. You know. Are they really, you know, one of however many five or ten in this particular category? Are they really committed to doing that, or are they out there to maybe hopefully get, cons you know, get bought by somebody? Because there's a lot of folks that that do that as well. Um, the number of, of vendors that came up to our booth and asked us about partnership opportunities and filling a gap in, you know, what we do, because you know, while we have a great portfolio, we don't do everything. Um, I don't think any company does everything unless you're one of these, you know, mega large integrators that can choose whoever they want. But there were people that were walking us that were interested in saying, hey, we're interested in some partnership opportunities. Um, hey, would you, we've got this right here. Is that something your organization might be interested to add to your portfolio, kind of hinting at potentially acquiring? I mean, you know, we'll have to ask uh, other people about that, but 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 that happens as well. I'll tell you one of the one of the aha moments or one of the surprise moments that I had at RSA, and this is my first RSA since 2019. Um, when I used to go to RSA in Black Hat, I would see the FBI booth on the outskirts, on the edge, in the middle. This past RSA, they were in the main part of the floor, in the middle of the floor, and uh, and they had. FBI and NSA next to each other. And then a few feet over, they had CISA over there as well. Like, wow, I've never seen NSA or CISA at one of these. Maybe they were there last year or the year before, but in years past, I've never seen them there either. So, you know, they're, they're doing some things. So I, I also take notice of who's in the main part of 
the room versus who's on on the outskirts. And as far as the entrance, the in in particular category, I mean, we could argue that we could argue that with a number of things. Like if you look at some of the original sim vendors, and then some of the vendors that came out a few years ago that were in the UEBA market, and then those that turned from UEBA to next gen sim. And then look at the number of endpoint security vendors. It seems like every, you know, for a while, there were a bunch every few years. Um, there's new email security vendors and email security has been around for the longest time. So there's always going to be kind of a new vendor or a new uh, somebody new to enter into the space. And it, 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 it really depends on what is it that you're able to do? What is it you're able to do different? How well do you integrate? Because nowadays, that's what customers want to know is how well do you play in the sandbox with this organization and that organization, and this provider and that provider? If they have something that's of value, I mean, that's why people are taking notice and that's why they're doing that. Now, let's wait and see five years from now how many of those are still there versus how many of them get scooped up potentially versus maybe the ones that don't don't make it but you know it, it, i it, it's a little surprising but at the end of the day when you take a step back and you look at the history of some of these categories out there you know like oh okay well that makes sense you have multiple that are in the same type of category yeah when money was cheap it was one thing money's a lot harder to get these days and i think it's really interesting to see how many of these guys survive with a i'm just going to build the next gen of x y and z because I think some of the established players in the market are going to be really hard to rip and replace out in a consolidated kind of flat budget cycle. I'm not sure all the startups have figured that out yet, but from a from what I see on the enterprise side, that's exactly what's happening. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the organizations are taking longer to make their decisions. They're scrutinizing to a new level. Um, in some cases, especially with some of those lesser known organizations, they want to know the health of the organization before deciding to pull the trigger. I've been at startups in my career. I was a part of those conversations or I knew those conversations were happening where they wanted to see the books. Now, whether or not they allow an, an organ, a potential uh, client to see their books, who knows? But yeah, I mean, sales cycles are taking longer um because they are putting much more scrutiny into what they do and not only that but they want to ensure that for a, a vendor that they say hey you told me that you can do this i want you to show me you can do it and show me that it's real versus saying oh we're doing all these things and we can promise you the world that we're the greatest things in sliced bread and then when it comes right down to it you realize that they can't they couldn't um they couldn't do everything that they said they they could do yeah, I mean, I'm seeing POCs to prove it out before they buy. I'm seeing uh, scrutiny on every single renewal. Renewals are being scrutinized across the board. It used to be if it was in the budget, it just went through. But now every every renewal is going through is almost as much scrutiny as a brand new purchase these days, which is just it's squeezing the little guys. I'm just telling you, right? And and mm -hmm. I think that's where the larger platform larger capability companies have an advantage in the current market right now only because it, they they can offer more as part of a contract instead of piecing a bunch of things together. And I think that's the paradigm we're going to be in for through the rest of this year, well into next year. And the, and the question will be, how long does it go after that until money gets right. easy again? <laughs> Absolutely. And, and you consider the, the turnover that happens at the leadership level of most of these organizations. I mean, every new leader is going to always scrutinize every dollar that's being spent because in some cases they're walking into something and they're unsure what that is. So they're going to scrutinize, like, do we really need this right here? Or, you know, let's understand the outcomes that we're getting with this, could we continue to get these outcomes with something else within our stack? Or could we replace one or two or multiple products from the stack with something else? I mean, they're looking at doing that as well. So, you know, absolutely, you know, at renewal time, they're doing the same thing. They're doing their due diligence. They're scrutinizing every single dollar that's being spent and understanding is there a better way we can spend this and improve um, our security posture with the dollars that we're spending. Yeah, absolutely.
I, I'm going to let Tyler or KT get back in here because uh, I kind of monopoly, monopolize the RSA conversation. I do have one follow up if nobody has one, but I, I want to give them a chance first. You no, know, continue. Go ahead. This is this is great. I'm just listening and uh, enjoying the conversation. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, supply chain, right, um, was a is an interesting one. I think a supply chain a little differently, Antonio. Right now, uh, the MSI UEFI vulnerability at the chip level. We've got some interesting things going around chip manufacturing, like. When we think about supply chain, sometimes we think about the finished product, but this is morphing very quickly into the components that are building end products. How scary is some of these new supply chain attacks down at kind of the chip and firmware level? Yeah, it's 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 it, the the number of hands that things pass through in order to do business nowadays, whether it be down to you know a whatever that finished hardware product is or even just whatever service that you're getting from another provider um you know it's it, it's one of those uh problems that's that every single organization is having to deal with um especially something that lives directly on a on a component like how do you look for that how do you ensure integrity of your finished product or finished good when you're getting components from different suppliers and manufacturers and the same thing can be said about how do you ensure integrity when you're doing you know you're getting a service not even a finished product but you're getting a service of some sort from one of your from one of your business partners as well that that has that they're taking the proper precautions and have the the levels of of scrutiny to protect their organization because something that happens that their organization could potentially affect yours as well so you know it, definitely a theme, definitely something that's on the top of mind of, of organizations. At the end of the day, it ha- the, at least from what we, you know, for, for us, the, 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 the supply chain, at least the way we think of it and the way the customers tell us is things like, I don't worry about the people that I do. Well, I not only do I have to worry about the pe- the organizations that I do business with directly, but my supply chain also extends beyond that. It's my supply chain supply chain. And that was something that was brought up, not just at RSA, but even previous conferences as well, is the supply chain ecosystem as a whole, whereas some are involved in the chip, the hardware, the finished product, others are involved with the service of potentially that, if not just the services in general, and ensuring that they're taking the same level of care to protecting the organization such that they don't do something that puts somebody within their supply chain um in a in a in a bad position so it'll be a theme that's gonna go on it'll go on well past this year and into next year as well and it, it's definitely something that's uh, that's top of mind for again organization whether it is something that you're getting a hardware product a hardware component within there all the way to a service that you're working with 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 one of your with one of your partners do you see yeah. the do you see that supply chain trickling down into the vendor space where we're going to be requiring the ability for interoperability integration and a lot le- a lot better collaboration with inside the ecosystem between all the platforms and products no matter what you're using uh, in order to combat some of this you know really difficult supply chain tax uh, complexity uh, adversaries that are just much more sophisticated do you think all of that's going to have to play into the vendor space as well where the the integration happens more i i think we have to i think we absolutely have to we have to you know it's like you know uh, again we're stronger together we have to play nice we have to we're we're all fighting the same enemy and those are those bad actors regardless of where they are in the world so as an organization, we have to, the more flexibility that we can build in as a, as a, as a community and not just a vendor community, just a community is uh, uh, in general, the better we're off we're going to be with respect to visibility, with respect to detecting things faster, with this respect to adapting to the new, to, to the new uh, tactics and techniques of the bad actors and the nefarious actors. So, you know, I, I it seems to me like we don't have a choice. We, we have to do it, or we as a community, as an entire security community, have to do it. Yeah, we rely on these components for some of our gear that we use to actually 
offer up security services, right? So, I mean, it behooves us to to be part of the solution to this as well, because think about all the firewall vendors and, and, and folks that, that are selling appliances and all the other things. Like, this could have huge impact to these security solutions because they're running on this hardware that potentially could be compromised. It's Yeah, I think it's a big problem. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Antonio. I mean, it, it goes back to, you know, I, I thought the theme... Again, sorry to go back to RSA, but I thought the theme was appropriate, which is stronger together. And that's what we need to be is yeah. we're stronger together. Yeah, absolutely. Antonio, thank you so much for joining us on Enterprise Security Weekly. Thank you for having me. Make sure you visit securityweekly.com forward slash Fortra to learn more. Stay tuned. When we come back, we're going to go over the weekly enterprise security news. <laughs> 